Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for us to welcome you to the uh, first morning session of the workshop on uh, multidisciplinary strategies uh, to target the central nervous system. Uh, first of all, I would, uh, I would like to advise you uh, that uh, there is a, a small change in the program since, uh, unfortunately, Professor Sharma was uh, unable to participate to the workshop, and so the first speaker of the session will be Professor Michel Kreschatisky from Mediterranean University of Marseille. Good morning. Uh, Professor Michel Kreschatisky is a research director at the National Center of Scientific Research and uh, Director of uh, Neurobiology of Cellular Interactions and uh, Neurophysiopathology of the Mediterranean University of Marseille. is an expert of uh, molecular and cellular biology and is author of uh, more than 70 papers published on scientific international journals and co-inventor of four patents. Professor Kreschatisky, uh, we speak about uh, the development of vectors for receptor-mediated transitosis-based drug targeting and drug delivery to the diseased central nervous system. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for uh, putting up this uh, very exciting uh, meeting. Uh, uh, many thanks to uh, Giovanni Tosi, who invited me at uh, this lecture uh, during this uh, symposium. It's uh, somewhat ironical that I get to uh, introduce the talks on drug delivery today, uh, just because uh, with my group or one of the groups of my lab, we're absolute beginners in this field. And uh, very ironically also, we do not have yet a single publication in this area. Uh, there are some reasons for this. Um, in my lab, we have interest in neurodegeneration and excitotoxicity, neuronal plasticity process. This is the one group directed by uh, Dr. Santiago Rivera. We also have some cell therapy uh, interest directed by Francois Ferron. And in the last years, we started to have interest in uh, drug delivery problems, uh, drug delivery questions, and interest in the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we started to devise a uh, research program and uh, could not get any funding for this, uh, for this program from our government, from the CNRS, from the university. Uh, so I decided with a uh, business investor, uh, Mr. Alexander Tukai, to try to create a biotech company uh, and get some pri private funding to try to address some of the questions and research programs we wanted to set up. So this private company is a biotechnology company. is called uh, Vectorus. Uh, it's still uh, set up in my lab. So this is a, uh, a very uh, good, for the moment, interaction between uh, public research and also private funded research. Um, the problem with uh, private research is that the objectives are clearly not the same as those for public research. Public research, we all try to publish uh, companies try to avoid publishing, at least in the first place, and they would rather go for patents. So some of the work uh, we have been doing is uh, eligible for patent. So for this reason, for the moment, although we've been working now for three years that this company is created, we still have no publications in this field. You will also bear with me because uh, some of the results are still in the process of being patented. So I will not disclose uh, some of the uh, information relative to molecule structures. Uh, but hopefully you'll still be able to read some of these, uh, some of these results and work in a close future. Uh, so uh, we have been uh, trying to develop vectors, peptide vectors, uh, to address the problematic of, uh, of uh, drug delivery. So where do I switch here? Okay. So a few words on general context and background, but you're all very aware of this. Um, there is an increasing incidence of CNS diseases. This is linked to uh, the increase in life expect expectancy. Also, new ways of life. We heard about yesterday uh, neuroaids. Neuroaids did not exist uh, 30 years ago. This is a rather recent uh, pathology of the central nervous system. We have prion diseases, uh, increased incidence of uh, brain tumors. And the estimated cost for CNS pathologies just in the European community is uh, between 500 and 700 billion euros per year. 
The paradox is that you have a rather interesting pipeline uh, for molecules that are able to treat CNS diseases that are efficient in vitro or in vivo in animal models. But uh, unfortunately, many of these molecules do not make it to, uh, to, to humans. Just as an example, for the field of Alzheimer's disease, there are more, there are close to 600 molecules that are currently being developed. Actually, there's only a small fraction of small lipophilic drugs that cross the BBB, usually inferior to 400 Daltons. And these drugs, which make most of the CNS market today, are essentially uh, dedicated to uh, affective disorders, depression, schizophrenia, some drugs for chronic pain, a good amount of drugs for epilepsy. But most other drugs, and mostly the larger drugs, uh, do not cross the BBB. And this would be the case for some interesting therapeutic peptides, uh, neurotrophic factors, some specific proteins that could be uh, eventually interesting for neurodegenerative diseases. Oh, thank you. You can see the mouse, right? So I'll just go on with the mouse. Thank you. A uh, number of proteins and neurotrophic factors that could be interesting in some neurodegenerative diseases. There's also a specific case for CNS uh, treatments is that there's a high failure rate and the time to market for drugs is higher than in any other uh, therapeutic areas. And one of the uh, main problems related to all these uh, questions is that of the blood-brain barrier um, and its uh, ability to very uh, efficiently prevent drugs from reaching the brain. So among the different solutions, you have targeted drug delivery, and this is the field we're interested in. The advantages if successful is that you can have a specificity of action, you can have improved efficacy, if you reduce side effects, you increase safety, and it's also an opportunity for life cycle uh, management uh, opportunities. We've uh, heard about yesterday a number of uh, molecules that are eventually efficient in the treatment of uh, tumors that reside in the brain, and many of these drugs, if they could be efficiently delivered to brain, uh, would prove rather efficient. So if we look at the transport across the BBB, we know that the BBB is a physical back barrier, but it's also a functional barrier. And some of the mechanisms of this barrier can be used efficiently to deliver drugs. In medicinal, traditional medicinal uh, chemistry, uh, what has been used up to now are essentially pharmacological-based drug delivery approaches. As I mentioned, small lipophilic drugs will cross the blood-brain barrier. Here you have the blood compartment. Here you would have the brain compartment. But many of these drugs are susceptible to efflux pumps, which will uh, eventually uh, re-throw them into the, the bloodstream. Uh, so there's been a number of uh, other procedures to, uh, to try to improve uh, drug delivery, and this is uh, using uh, positive charges. Uh, this is adsorptive mediated uh, transport, AMT. This process, uh, sorry. Uh, In this process, uh, molecules that are positively charged will uh, interact with a negatively tar charged membrane and hence be endocytosed and eventually cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we heard yesterday about the TAT peptide. The TAT peptide is a poly has a polyarginine uh, structure and this is probably the positive charge of this peptide that allows it to efficiently cross uh, the blood-brain barrier. There are a number of physiological-based drug delivery approaches that are based on physiological systems. Uh, one of these systems is the uh, carrier-mediated transport, the CMT. Uh, and this process, which uses uh, or which transports uh, essentially small molecules, nutrients such as vitamins, glucose, uh, uh, amino acids, in this system, the carrier systems uh, bind to the molecules in the bloodstream, deliver them into the cells, and then the same carrier systems on the other side would transport them from the cell into uh, the brain parenchyma. And finally, the process that we are most interested in, the physiological process we're most interested, interested in, is receptor-mediated transcytosis, RMT. In this process, you have a number of receptors that have specific ligands, which are some of them uh, macromolecules, such as uh, LDL, low-density lipoproteins. You also have transferrin, which the protein carries uh, iron. A number of these receptors will bind to their ligands, natural ligands in the blood, be endocytosed and eventually transported across the cell. There might be some passage through endosomal uh, compartments, but anyway, some of these ligands are then liberated on the, uh, on the brain side. So in a very uh, schematized uh, way, this is the principle of uh, drug delivery via RMT. If a drug uh, has inability to cross or enter the blood-brain barrier, this drug can be conjugated to a uh, molecule, a vector, 
we call a vector, and this vector has affinity for a RMT receptor. This RMT receptor, as I said, can be transported across the cell, and the drug uh, vector uh, conjugate can then be liberated uh, on the brain side, eventually separated from the peptide, from the uh, vector, and this drug can then have its effects on its um, uh, target receptor. As far as we're concerned, the vector molecules that we're trying to develop are peptide-based vectors. So we had a lot of criticism from uh, people when we go and look for funding, also when we have contacts with industrial partners concerning peptides. Uh, many people are negative uh, when we talk about peptides in, uh, in general and as therapeutic agents in particular. Uh, so because we questioned this issue, uh, we did a very exhaustive search in the literature and around us about peptides, therapeutic peptides. And in fact, this search led to the writing of a, um, of a review by Patrick Vlieg, one of my colleagues and myself, uh, on synthetic therapeutic peptides. Today, there are more than 50 synthetic therapeutic peptides that are on the market, so I think peptides are definitely used in therapy. It's already a large market, 8 billion uh, euros in 2005 and close to 12 billion in the next years uh, by 2013. We know also from this review that there are more than 100 peptides now that are not synthetic peptides, that are extracted from natural sources or recombinant peptides. More than 100 peptides, oligopeptides, proteins that have been marketed. And we also know that there are about 30 antibodies now, essentially monoclonal antibodies, that are now uh, for di used for diagnostic or clinical use. So this issue of peptides, I think, is no more an issue. The pharmaceutical industry is able to handle peptides and work with them. The interesting part about peptides is that uh, they, are, they can be uh, conjugated to a number of uh, different types of molecules. They can be conjugated to small organic drugs, eventually also to therapeutic peptides, of course. They can be conjugated to nucleosides, siRNA. They can be conjugated uh, through fusion protein constructs to proteins, different types of antibodies. And also, they could be eventually associated with drugs in nanovectors, whether they're liposomes, nanoparticles. And this is one of the issues that we're interested in developing through this interaction we have for theoretical interaction we have with uh, Giovanni Tosi for the last year. Peptides used as vectors and conjugated to drugs can be uh, separated with the uh, from the drug by different types of linkers. You can have acid-sensitive linkers, uh, lysosomotropic li linkers that will eventually be cleaved in the lysosome, enzymatic cleaved uh, linkers, for example, using uh, proteases that are close to a cell that is undergoing a type of pathology. We know that uh, cancer cells produce a number of specific proteases. You can also have disulfide bond cleavage, so there are a number of linkers that can be used for uh, pro-drug type uh, of delivery. Now, a few words on the technological platform and some of the results that we have obtained in the last years. This is a one slide to summarize our research strategy. So as I told you, we're interested in RMT receptors. So our strategy is to clone these receptors, a number of receptors, uh, from human uh, data, data, uh, sequence databases, express those uh, in cell lines, establish stable cell lines, purify also these receptors. All these are receptors described in the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we screen these uh, cell lines, established cell lines, or purified uh, receptors with uh, peptide libraries that are very complex, that encode uh, 10 billion or 100 billion different peptides. So we screen uh, these uh, receptors with these peptide libraries. We try to obtain peptide hits. We synthesize the appropriate peptides once we've selected them, and we start comparing them and analyzing them for their ability in vitro and in vivo to cross the blood-brain barrier. Then we go through the chemical optimization of these peptide vectors. We can patent them at this stage. And then, of course, the most interesting part, sorry, most interesting part is the chemical conjugation of these peptide vectors to uh, drug candidates. You can eventually then patent those new uh, conjugates. So among the selected receptors that we're working on, there are some receptors of the LDL uh, receptor family. LDL is a complex of uh, lipids, essentially cholesterol with uh, proteins, apolipoprotein E, apolipoprotein B100. 
So you have the different members of the LDL receptor family, the human LDL receptor, HLDLR. You have LRP1, which is also a scavenger receptor, LRP8. Other receptors that are uh, amenable for um, transcytosis are the uh, transferrin receptor, a uh, number of receptors for insulin, insulin growth factor, and so on. And I'm going to give you the example of our strategy on one receptor. This is the LDL receptor. So we start by biopanning uh, screening strategies because the peptide libraries that we're using are presented by phage, bacteriophage, which are uh, bacterial viruses. So we have, as I said, 10 billion, 100 billion different phage that present different peptides at one of their extremities. These phage libraries are put in contact with the purified receptors or with the cell lines that express these receptors. Through uh, washing procedures, uh, you can then conserve those phage that have affinity for a given receptor. You can elute these phage either by acid uh, treatment of, uh, of your cells or your purified receptors, or you can eventually try to displace your phage with specific ligands if you're looking for phage that interact with a specific um, domain on your receptor. The uh, phage that are uh, isolated in this way are then thrown back into the uh, screening process, and this goes on for about three, four rounds until we isolate individual clones of phage that have affinity for a given receptor. This would be the type of picture that you get. This is a cell line that is expressing, for example, the LDL receptor. Uh, we make genetic constructs that the receptors are fluorescent. They are fusion proteins with the GFP. So this would be the, uh, the uh, cell expressing the receptor. It's green. And in red, you have the phage particles that bind onto the receptors presented by these cells. And of course, the immunohistochemistry is in red on the phage particles. Once we have isolated a number of different phage, we put these phage into competition. We compare them with each other to try to select those phage that have the uh, best affinity for the targeted receptor. These are essentially uh, flow cytometry experiments where our cell line is submitted to different clones of phage. And uh, we see with facts whether some of the phage, this would be the uh, green component on this side, uh, the increased number of or uh, the, the cells that have increased expression of the uh, of the receptor. If you have positive phage with the uh, antibodies that will give you the red labeling, then uh, your uh, population of cells detected by the fax system will go into this quadrant. And the more the cells are green, the more phage are bound to these cells. Once we have isolated a number of uh, clones, phage clones, then we sequence these indiv individual clones to establish the sequence of the peptides that are carried by these clones, and we start comparing the peptide sequences. In the case of this one receptor, we found a number of phage that were encoding for uh, peptide sequences that had a very conserved type of structure. Actually, we're able to establish a consensus motif, which you have here, where you always have a cysteine on one side, a number of amino acids here, a conserved motif with three amino acids that we've always found in all the phage uh, that bound to this receptor, another cysteine indicating that in fact this peptide had a, a constrained structure with a, probably a disulfide bond. We've isolated peptides that were between 7, 12 and 15 amino acids. This has led us then to start studying the ability of these individual peptides to bind on our receptors. So now we just eliminate the phage part, we just work with the peptides. This would be one of our lead peptides, number 411, VH411. This would be the 15 amino acid uh, sequence of this peptide. We establish, uh, we put in a spacer sequence and we've linked this peptide to what we call a peptide marker. This is a S tag. The S tag has two properties. The first property is that you are able to reconstitute an enzymatic activity with this S tag because this moiety will reconstitute a RNA's activity. If you present to this uh, peptide plus RNAs a uh, RNA molecule with quench fluorescence, if the RNA's activity is uh, induced by the presence of this, uh, oops, sorry. by the presence of this TAT peptide, then you will get a fluorescence. So in this way, we can put our peptides on our cell lines uh, and establish whether how they bind, the intensity of the binding, uh, which is related to the intensity of the fluorescence. This is the case here, for example, for a uh, control peptide with the S tag compared to one of our peptides that binds with uh, much more affinity 
on the cell line. The second advantage of the S-tag is that uh, there are some uh, very good antibodies that can detect this S-tag. So all of our peptides can be followed on cell lines, even in vivo, using uh, basic immunohistochemistry. Cytochemistry. So we were able to show that this uh, lead vector conjugated to the S-tag, recognized by a primary antibody, a secondary antibody, uh, which was in itself fluorescent, this whole structure can be endocytosed by cells, meaning that this peptide alone will allow this entire structure to be not only captured by cells, not only bind to cells, but also be captured and transported into cells. This is what you have here. This would be the cell line expressing the receptor. In green, you can see the receptor here at the membrane, and there's a lot of receptor also that is endocytosed and that is uh, perinuclear. If you put the, uh, this whole conjugate in presence of these cells, you will find uh, that uh, this conjugate is accumulated intracellularly at the same places where you have the high levels of receptor accumulation. This is the merge picture where everything is yellow, where you have uh, co-labeling of the uh, conjugate with the presence of the receptor. Now, endocytosis does not mean transcytosis, so we also use uh, in vitro uh, BBB models to uh, evaluate the potential for our peptides to cross the blood-brain barrier. This model will be uh, developed, I think, by uh, Florence Delis, so I'm not going to go into much detail, but you can have uh, endothelial cells that differentiate into appropriate or semi-appropriate blood-brain barriers. If you grow these cells, uh, and help them differentiate with uh, co-cultures of astrocytes. These would be the tight junctions that you establish uh, between the, these cells uh, using ZO1 or occluding uh, antibodies. And uh, these uh, in vitro BBB models are now pretty well established uh, in our lab. What we can show on these models in the first place is that applying some of our peptides on the different, uh, on the, uh, on the blood-brain barrier, our peptides are non-toxic for these barriers. Uh, and here in blue, you have the Lucifer yellow, which is uh, a marker that we use to uh, validate the cultures. If Lucifer yellow goes through the, the cultures, that means they are permeable. Normally, these cultures are highly impermeable to Lucifer yellow. By these means, just to make a long story short, we show that our peptides are non-toxic for, um, for the cells, meaning that Lucifer yellow does not pass uh, very well even after long-term exposure uh, of these cells to our peptides. We show that some of these peptides accumulate into the endothelial cells, and this is uh, across time. We also show that across time, some of our peptides will accumulate in the lower compartment because these cells separate two different compartments in these uh, little, um, in these little uh, inserts. These are in vitro results on blood-brain barrier. The next question is whether these peptides uh, have a good uh, transport uh, ability uh, in, uh, in, in the blood-brain barrier in vivo. This is a collaboration that we have with uh, Professor Jean-Michel Sherman in, uh, in CIRM and also collaboration with uh, Vincent Dive in the CEA, the Neurospin platform in Saclay. So our peptides are radio-labeled. Uh, their biodistribution is also studied in the CIRA. I will not go into this, but they are radio-labeled. And then in this lab, uh, this is a lab that's specialized in assessing the kinetics of transport of radioactive molecules from the blood into the brain. But you bypass uh, the entire uh, organism. Uh, you bypass liver, um, kidneys, and everything. And the only thing that is measured is uh, the amount of radioactive molecules that go through the blood-brain barrier when you inject into the carotids. So these are really studies to study the kinetics of passage of your molecules into, uh, into the brain. The um, coefficient transport is called the K-in. The K-in for one of our lead peptides is uh, 0 0.35. This is expressed in microliter per grams per second. Uh, it's uh, very similar to that of a natural ligand, for example, such as transferrin. And uh, these type of results with some of our lead peptides encourage us to go through uh, the next step, which was chemical optimization. In chemical optimization, this is a collaboration we have with the uh, IBMM Institute in Montpellier, specialized in uh, peptide uh, chemistry, and uh, under the, uh, the, the responsibility of Jean Martinez and Vincent Lisowski. 
In this uh, chemical optimization, we start here with our lead peptide, which is 50 amino acids long, using Alascan uh, strategies. Uh, we're able to reduce its size to eight amino acids. We also have D-scan strategies, uh, which allowed us to replace one of the amino acids by a non-natural amino acid. And just this shortening and putting this non-natural amino acid has allowed us to increase the affinity uh, for the receptor. We also have an increased uh, K-in for this uh, optimized uh, vector, which is still in the process of optimization because there are many, many different unnatural amino acids that you can test. We went further and already have some uh, data about the toxicity of one of these uh, lead vectors. We're also studying the half-life uh, in plasma. It's pretty good. It's superior to two hours. This is probably due to the fact that we have a uh, cyclic peptide. Uh, some of these peptides now are uh, being uh, patented. Uh, and, of course, what we're most interested in is knowing whether these peptides have an interest in uh, drug targeting into the brain. Uh, the first question when you start making a conjugate, and in our case, just to go quickly into the proof of concept therapeutic efficacy, uh, which shows uh, models of nociception, um, sensitivity of mice, and you can affect nociception by uh, interfering with the opiate receptors uh, centrally in these animals. So one of the important questions is whether uh, when you make a conjugate, uh, does your vector still uh, allow binding to your targeted receptor? The answer is yes. These are displacement experiments where our, our vector, labeled vector with a tag system, uh, is eventually displaced by the different molecules we uh, submitted it. If we just put the drug alone, we get no displacement. If we put the drug plus linker, barely no <coughs> displacement. If we put the drug plus vector, we essentially displace the, uh, the labeled vector. And if we put the drug plus linker, or one type of linker plus vector, then we get 100% displacement. So it appears that associating the vector, at least with a therapeutic peptide, because in this case, the, the drug we're using is therapeutic peptide. It's a peptide-based molecule that acts on the opiate receptors. Uh, conjugating this drug to uh, the vector via linker does not affect the binding on the RMT receptor. Does it affect the uh, ability uh, to go through the blood-brain barrier? No, we went back into radio labeling the vector drug conjugates and established the K-in in collaboration with uh, Jean-Michel Sherman in Paris. This would be the K-in of the drug, it's uh, 0.01 and the drug plus linker plus vector is close to two. So just uh, vectorizing the drug increases 20-fold its uh, uh, access into the brain. The next question, of course, is whether by binding or conjugating the drug to a vector, you lose the potential of the drug to bind to its own receptor. In this case, I told you it was the opiate receptor. These are displacement experiments where we have a, uh, an antagonist of this drug, which is radio-labeled. And these experiments are done uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Régis Guilleux, Jocelyne Condot in Marseille. If you have an antagonist, radioacti radioactive antagonist, you can displace this antagonist with a drug. If you put the drug plus linker, you still displace the uh, radio-labeled antagonist. If you put the vector alone, you get nothing. And if you put vector plus linker plus drug, you get the same type of displacements that you had here. We've also shown that the signal transduction that is elicited uh, at the level of these opiate receptors by measuring CAMP levels is still also efficient using vector plus linker plus drug. The last question now is whether this conjugate has some effects in vivo. Uh, so we've been working on uh, intracerebroventricular first experiments, which are irrelevant for the blood-brain barrier, of course, but it allows us to measure the fact that the conjugate <coughs> is still effective in neural tissue. ICV experiments, then we went through IP experiments, and now we're in process of doing uh, IV uh, administration. These are uh, ex still ongoing experiments. Uh, I think we're more than 600 mice that have been injected now, and we use the hot plate test or tail flick test, tail pinch test. The take home message is that this would be the effects of the drug alone in increasing uh, the latency of the mice. You know, they have to, to draw their paw after, uh, after they, they put the, the animals are put onto a hot plate, and you measure the time or the increase in time necessary for the animal to react. 
So drug plus vector plus linker is more efficient than a drug alone. The vector itself has no effects. One important aspect also in drug delivery is, uh, as I said, the potential to use different types of linkers. And uh, just also to make a long story short, different linkers have very different uh, effects. Here, also measured in vivo, you can see this would be a L1 linker, uh, which is a classical uh, three uh, glycines, for example, or four glycines. It would be a L6 linker, which is a lysosomal uh, lysosomotropic linker. You can see that just changing the linker can enhance uh, 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 very substantially the in vivo effects that we get with the conjugates. What are the next steps now? So, as I told you, we've set up one program and a technological platform. We're working on different types of RMT receptors. I gave you the example with one receptor. So we find RMT-specific peptides. Uh, we try to see if these peptides cross the blood-brain barrier and try to develop them as trans-barrier vectors. This is the ongoing program. We have another program that we have uh, started, which is trying to uh, target more specifically uh, regions of the brain that are uh, uh, undergoing any forms of pathology. It's uh, generally admitted that when you have brain pathology, when brain lesions, uh, you have inflammation, neuroinflammation. And this neuroinflammation has an impact on the blood-brain barrier. Uh, the blood-brain barrier itself can become inflamed. So we are working on trying to develop some peptides that will be more specific for the inflamed BBB. In this sense, we might have a better targeting strategy only to those structures of the brain that are undergoing either pathology or lesions. So how do we go about this? Uh, so the ongoing program is the following. <clears throat> We're trying, as I said, to develop peptide vectors specific for inflamed BBB. So we use the um, in vitro BBB models. We can use either anti-inflammatory cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and then we establish transcriptome analysis of these cells to try to find genes that are overexpressed in one case and overexpressed in the other case. By studying the different uh, genes that are induced, these are uh, high, th high throughput uh, screen analysis with the uh, Agilent uh, probes. So we have 40,000 genes we can look at. The idea is to find those surface molecules and hopefully RMT receptors that would be induced in the pro-inflammatory state. Then we just apply our, the strategy I've been describing to you, which is clone the most interesting of these uh, receptors, express them on cell lines or purify them, screen them with phage, and uh, from the sequences then work and develop peptides that hopefully will be more specific for the inflamed, uh, inf uh, inflamed endothelial cells. Just a few words now to acknowledge the uh, partners in this, uh, in this work. The chemical optimization of our peptides is done at the IBMM in Montpellier uh, with Vincent Lisovsky and Jean Martinez. Radio labeling and small animal imaging, which I haven't mentioned, is done in CEA in Saclay, Thierry Dugave and Vincent Dive. The uh, blood-brain passage in vivo and the brain perfusion experiments are done by uh, Salvatore Cisternino, Jean-Michel Sherman's lab in CIRM in Paris. Uh, my lab, of course, in, in Marseille is uh, heavily uh, involved in these uh, projects. And the nociception experiments are done uh, in collaboration with uh, this uh, university laboratory in Marseille under the responsibility of Regis Guilleux and uh, Jocelyne Condo. Uh, strangely, when we started with this work, we could, got, we could get no public support uh, in, this, uh, in this project uh, once we got private support and that we created a company to develop this uh, project, then it became much more easier to get public funding. There is something strange in our system. Anyway, we must acknowledge uh, public subsidies also in this program uh, from the Délégation Générale des Entreprises, uh, Fonds Unique Interministériel in France. This is a program that's going on for spinal cord lesions, so we're also working on the blood-brain barrier of the spinal cord. Uh, there's another program that's called TIMPAD that is uh, financed by the Agence Nationale de la Recherche. And this is a program specific for receptors that are enhanced in Alzheimer's disease. And the last program is vic brain uh, also financed by the INR, where we're supposed to develop drug conjugates not only for uh, pain, but also for uh, cancer drugs and, um, and uh, infectious diseases of the brain. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people with whom I'm working directly on this project. This is in Marseille. 
uh, which we call the Victorious Group in my lab. So we have uh, Patrick Vlieg, who is uh, responsible of the uh, development uh, aspects of this program. He's uh, Dr. Patrick Vlieg is a chemist. Uh, we have two biotech engineers, Marion David, Yves Molino, and the technical help of Françoise Jabès, Aude Fortoul, and Karima Bakloul. One person is missing because she works in Montpellier. She works as a chemist in Montpellier, Nathine Bayrou. She's not on the picture. And I'd like to acknowledge also my partner in setting up this company, Alexander Tokai, who acts as the president of this company. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Krischatiski, for uh, your very interesting and clear presentation. And uh, now the lecture is open for, for discussion. If there are any questions? Oh, yes, it was indeed a very impressive presentation. Um, you're working with peptides. And as you told us at the beginning of your lecture, there's peptides everywhere, and that these peptides definitely affect behavior. Now, when you're looking at antinociception, do you see any changes in sleep, hunger, sexual activity, or anything else that your peptide <laughs> vectors might be affecting? So as I told you, these, uh, this part of the work we're doing with the peptides in vivo, we started last summer. Uh, so we're in the very preliminary stages still of the in vivo experiments. Uh, as I said, we're looking whether the peptides are toxic or not. Uh, this was our primary concern. They end up being toxic, of course, at high, high doses. Uh, and we're essentially focusing for the moment on the hot plate test, tail flake test, and also on the in vitro uh, part to see how the binding uh, occurs and where, whether we get the signal transduction at the level of the receptor. So our in vivo studies, I would say, are still very, very preliminary. We'll have to go through the real full-scale study uh, in vivo uh, once we establish firmly the proof of principle. Yes? Uh, do you think there will be a potential for using your peptides for huge molecules like um, carriers or macromolecular carriers, basically, or uh, nanoparticles in the future? As I mentioned, uh, the few experiments we did, we did with what I would consider as rather large structures because it's peptide plus two antibodies primary plus secondary antibodies, we know that this entire complex can be endocytosed with no problem. Uh, we have the hope that these peptides can also be used to decorate any form of nanoparticles, nanospheres, uh, and this is the interaction we'd like to develop with, uh, with Giovanni Tosi from the, with the uh, nanoparticles that they are developing. And of course, if I'm here, it's to say also that we are open to any form of uh, test and collaborations. Uh, we are ready to, to establish uh, partnerships and uh, collaborations with people who have any form of uh, complexes that they would like to decorate with our peptides. Uh, if I am correct, I remember that there are publications showing that the, uh, the portion which is recognized by the receptor or LDL has been uh, published, I guess, uh, three or four times, and is a 18 long peptide that is, has been proposed to be used as a dimer. Okay, so maybe that you are aware of this. This, this publication. Uh, you mentioned the work of uh, the yeah. company Angiochem. Yes, but uh, so, so they're but targeting the LRP1 receptor. But, but my, 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 my question was, was not about uh, mm -hmm. the, the exact composition, but uh, have you compared the affinity of your? Uh, peptide with that one which is reported in the literature? So we're following very closely this uh, development because the strategy is more or less the same in the sense that they are developing peptides. Uh, but that's the only resemblance that there are between our two strategies. They are focusing on one receptor which is LRP1 and they start with the endogenous ligands. LRP1 has many many different ligands. About 40 ligands have been described. If you align these 40 ligands, you can find motifs 
that are probably the motifs that allow the interaction with the peptides. And this is this motif that they have developed to make a vector. Uh, it's much longer than our vectors. They're 18 amino acid long, as you said. We're down to eight amino acids now. Their peptides are linear, ours are cyclic, so there are some differences in terms of stability. We have not yet gone into the process of comparing uh, in the same uh, paradigms their peptides with ours. We've, for the moment, compared our peptides with our peptides, which was already rather heavy, but of course we'll have to go through uh, comparing the peptides of competitors with ours. The only thing I can say is that we can compare the K-ins because the uh, way of measuring K-in is a standard procedure and our K-ins are very similar to their K-ins. What I think is that irrespective of whether how many different strategies are being developed, how many molecules can be used to target the brain, I think all these strategies will be complementary rather than uh, exclusive and probably uh, there would be some interest in trying to uh, conjugate drugs with different types of vectors in order to enhance drug delivery. So many of these strategies are, as I said, rather complementary. It's also uh, possible that some receptors will be uh, preferentially used or need to be preferentially used in some pathologies or some brain structures that you want to target rather than others. So it's interesting that there are those many different uh, uh, programs that are being developed. Uh, may, I, uh, may I put another question? Yeah. Uh, concerning this point, uh, there is uh, always the, 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 the concern that anyway, these receptors are uh, present in all the endothelia. So which is the uh, possibility that you think or you figure about the possibility to target a specific receptor in, uh, in the brain. Have, well, you, our, have, you any, our, have you any information about our this? First object, as, as you say, these receptors are everywhere. So our first objective is not to target specifically the brain. Our objective is to try to get something into the brain, even if at the same time you get more of it into the liver or into other cells. After, of course, you have to the toxicology, you have to the biodistribution, see how these uh, conjugates are processed, notably in the liver. Uh, there are many LDL receptors in the liver, for example. If at the same time you can enhance 20-fold or 50-fold the amount of drug that you get into the brain, maybe at least you've reached uh, one objective. And as I said, we're trying to develop some strategies where we're trying to identify some uh, surface molecules or receptors that would be more specific of the blood-brain barrier and hopefully more specific of the diseased brain in which this blood-brain barrier is being active. So our first objective, once again, is just to cross the blood-brain barrier. Second objective, much longer term and maybe irrealist, is to try to have brain-specific targeting and hopefully lesion-specific targeting. Do you have uh, some data about uh, the stability of this uh, system? both uh, in plasma and uh, also in uh, storage conditions? So the, these are ongoing studies. So the, the preliminary data we have in human plasma, as I said, is a half-life of two hours with the cyclic peptides. But we didn't do it with the conjugates yet. Okay. What about the molecular weight, the average molecular weight of this peptide, the range of molecular weight? Uh, if you're, we if you, yes, if you're yeah. fast, eight amino acids. Eight amino acids, okay. Thank you. I have just a general question for you and just a comment. Uh, there are several targeting agents which are used for uh, brain delivery to, to improve the, 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 the delivery of drugs uh, in, into the brain. In, in your, by your point of view, uh, what is the characteristics? I mean, how much must increase the delivery of drugs uh, uh, to define a good targeting agent because uh, the, there are several molecules which are used, but uh, the, the increase is often very, very small. It's very little. What do you think is a good uh, uh, level of uh, uh, increase in uh, drug delivery? It's, it's a very general question. Uh, yeah, it's very general, so I'll just give you a very general answer. Um, it turns out that uh, it will depend, it will be drug specific. As you know, there's no such thing as totally impermeable blood brain barrier. Any drug that you put in at a given concentration or high concentration, you will eventually find some level into the brain, right? Uh, the question is how much do you need to get the effective dose? 
if we look at the uh, peptides from this uh, other company that's called Angiochem, which derived peptides that target the LRP1 receptor, uh, their peptides are able to increase nearly 100-fold the amount of paclitaxel, which if conjugated to their peptides, into the brain. So they're trying to develop um, anti-cancer drugs that will, whose, whose penetration to the brain will be enhanced. And they are at least tenfold, if not a hundredfold, over. Yeah, they're tenfold over the uh, the active dose necessary to have effects on tumor cells. So I think the answer will be really dependent on the drugs themselves. Probably, if you can increase a twentyfold or hundredfold the amount of a drug into the brain with uh, drug delivery strategies, uh, you might end up having, in most cases, uh, reach. You might end up reaching the effective doses that you need, and at the same time, being able to reduce uh, very significantly the amount of drug you put into the body, and hence many of the secondary effects. Uh, any other question? No, I have one for you, Michel. Thank you very much for being here, first of all. Um, and thanks for your presentation. I would like to, to ask you about in situ brain perfusion, uh, which could be um, a damage for the blood brain barrier. And I would like to ask you if uh, the, te the integrity of the blood brain barrier was assessed. Yeah, each time um, our colleagues do the brain, uh, inside your brain perfusion, they assess the, okay. uh, the potential damage of the drugs that they are uh, using on the blood-brain barrier. In the case of the, all the peptides we have been giving them and the conjugates, there was no toxicity. Okay. I cannot say in the long term. As you know, these experiments are done in a very short term. Yeah, yeah. A few minutes. We also put our peptides, as I say, on in vitro models of blood-brain barrier, and to now we have no uh, evidence of uh, opening of the blood-brain barrier, meaning no evidence of uh, toxicity of these peptides on, uh, on the models. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, 